Well, good morning and welcome to St. Matthew's 8 o'clock uh, morning worship. Um, and this is the 13th Sunday in Pentecost. Uh, and the welcome is extended to those who are sitting in the pews, uh, also to those who are watching us live through the stream. Uh, and um, welcome also for those who have chosen uh, to tune in to our worship time later in the week um, from the website. So there are many things that, uh, many ways in which we can gather and worship. Um, for the benefit of those who don't know, uh, my name is Michael Strong and together with our special guest, uh, the Reverend Carmel, now, Irachi. Um, I, I forgot to ask her before we come in, but anyway, you all know, you've got it from Irachi herself. Um, and uh, uh, Carmel, which is easier for me to say than Irachi, is currently the, the, the Minister of the Word at Castle Hill Wesley, um, and uh, she's been able to find her way down Old Northern Road to here. Um, and she has a special connection already with this congregation. Maybe you don't all know, but she was a member of our joint nominating committee that uh, came up with a recommendation of John Humphreys for our next Minister of the Word. And in the vestry, I was just asking Carmel, would she mind um, coming and have a bit of a conversation with me? Uh, come here. I don't want you to be... <clears throat> this is this we can take it in turns all right um i saw on your bio that uh, you're an adelaidean i am indeed um a great city city of churches Woohoo! okay um yes mike and and was it in adelaide that you came to um start your journey along christ's way for you it is it certainly is so um it's, I grew up in a Catholic home and it started with learning about God and having a deep desire to know God more. But it was actually in Melbourne where I was living later in, in my teens when I was invited to a church service where someone eloquently explained about Jesus and the wonder of having a close relationship with Jesus. And that stirred my heart. And it was the spirit of God who moved me to step forward and pray a wonderful prayer that Jesus might come into my life and help guide my way. And in fact, that is exactly what Jesus has done for me. And I'm thrilled to be here today to share that. One other question. Um, did your Catholic beginnings persuade you to go to Rome? No. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. So from the Catholic but Church... You did go to Rome. I did. I did. From the Catholic Church, I... I uh, attended many other different denominations, Protestant denominations, and I was part of a, a global organisation that teaches the Bible. And uh, it was with Bible Study Fellowship International that I was invited to be an ambassador to Rome and to do some pioneer work starting a class for Catholics and Protestants together. Very ecumenically minded I am. All right, well, let's uh, say, Carmel, we'll hear from you a little later. Thanks so much, Mike. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for sharing a little of your life with us this morning. Um, Joy Murphy Wandon, who's a Yurundjeri elder, um, in a publication called Australians Together, said this, Welcome to country and acknowledgement of country is a very important way of giving Aboriginal people back their place in society and an opportunity for us to say, we are real, us being Aboriginal, that is, because it's a, her, her speaking, we are real, we are here, and today we welcome you to our land. 
It's paying respect in a formal sense and a following traditional custom as a symbolic way. Um, just a couple of notices. Uh, in the news sheet for this week, um, again, Dean Drayton has been uh, generous in letting us know his thoughts about the lectionaries, lectionary readings that are on for this weekend. They're worth a read. They're not easy reading, but they're worth it just the same. Um, and who is my neighbour is a conversation being uh, shared between uh, Clive Pearson at, and Dr Mania Talia. And that's, this is on the 14th of September here at St Matthews. And you say to yourself, is Clive coming back? But for one occasion, one conversation about focusing on uh, climate change and our faith, where does it fit? So it's worth looking at the details for that on our newsletter. Now it's time for us to have our, um, our shared call of worship. Um, so I'll read the gold and you are the, you are the white ones. God, our holy parent, the magnitude and mystery of the universe is a simple thing to you. Christ Jesus, our holy brother, the wonder of the gospel of love is a free gift from you. Spirit, truth, our holy friend, the power that sustains all things is contained in your intimacy. Please bless us, most holy and loving God, for in your blessing is our health and our happiness. For your love's sake, amen. And now it's our time for our first song this morning. Uh, and Eulalie whispered in my ear that we're going to be doing something a little different in this time. We're going to be almost having a round, but it's not quite a round. It's two halves. Um, and we're going to have uh, a practice on, our on the first verse together. Uh, and then we'll have the extreme side of the congregation uh, saying the first parts of the, uh, of the verse, and that'll be followed up by the nearer side uh, of the congregation. Um, so let's see how it goes. Thanks, Eulalie, for the music, and we'll all stand if we're able.
What say we all do it together, just for this, this particular screen, and then we'll think we've had enough. deserve to sit down after that. <laughs> Maybe that's something you could talk about after the worship this morning and see what you could do to do better next time. Um, I remember uh, Nicholas Freed used to often say, um, practice makes better rather than practice makes perfect. So maybe next time, when Eula Lee chooses that one, we'll be able to demonstrate that we're better. In the meantime, let us come to a time of prayer, prayer of praise, thanksgiving and forgiveness. So let us pray together. Irrepressible God, we thank you for hiding yourself in daily lives where we can know you, yet not define you, trust you, yet not direct you, celebrate you, yet not predict you, love you, and forever adore you. Sinners falling short of the mark, and Lord, you know we all do that. So in making our confession, Lord God, even if we had not seen your light and love in Jesus, we might be discontent with many of our thoughts, words and actions. But since you have shown us your beauty in Christ, we are much more aware of how badly we have fallen short, of how far we, have, we are from the fulfilling of our potential. We bring to you now the conglomerate that comprises our lives. We bring the small diamonds of success and the clay of failure, the gems we are proud to remember, and the slag that makes us ashamed, the silver smattering of wisdom and the dross of our folly, the hopes that still shine like gold, and the mud of pessimism. We confess all that we are and everything that we have seen and put ourselves unconditionally in your hands. Holy friend, we thank you that the same Christ whose beauty highlights our fall, fallen condition also highlights your inexhaustible mercy. In your hands is forgiveness. In your hands is healing. In your hands is encouragement. In your hands is peace. Touch us now and we shall be made whole for your love's sake. Amen. And some words of assurance. Sisters and brothers, Christ did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be redeemed. He is the one who declares to those who come to him in faith, your sins are forgiven you. Go in peace. And we all say, thanks be to God. I'm a bit reluctant. The next part of our worship is another song. Oh, Jesus, I have promised. It's a well-known song and we're going to sing it together. Uh, and uh, after a little introduction from Eula Lee, if you're able, we'll stand and sing together.
well, we all did a bit better that time. Um, and uh, it just shows you, we've got another interesting song coming up a bit later on as well. Uh, so we're going to be excellent that time. Now, the theme of our worship this morning is Jesus' identity, living the questions. Uh, and this is perhaps being sparked by uh, the gospel reading for today. Uh, and Shamali will come and read the gospel for us this morning. Thanks, Shamali. morning. <clears throat> Today's Bible reading is taken from St. Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven. Then, he sternly ordered them, the disciples, not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Hear the word of the Lord. And you've guessed it. It's time for us to sing again. The summons. Um, will you come and follow me? Please stand if you're able.
please be seated. Good morning, everyone. It is a delight to be with you this morning. Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege. Um, my name is Carmel Arachi. It looks worse on paper than it does when you say it. Um, I, too, would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land upon which we worship today and give thanks for their elders past, present and emerging. Let us pray. Loving God, this morning we meet in your holy name and ask that you would speak to our hearts just where we are. Help us know you deeper, help us love you a little stronger and help us be strengthened through your word as we live out our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if I were to go around the room today at this moment and ask each one of you, which I won't, maybe, um, who do you say Jesus is? I wonder what answers we might hear. I think your stained glass window gives us a clue. The way, the truth, and the life. We would come up, I imagine, with all sorts of answers, perhaps from our Sunday school days, perhaps from parents and their teaching, or perhaps school. It may be that you will look up a Wikipedia definition and discover all sorts of possibilities of who people say that Jesus is. It may be that that's the very question that you like to avoid. You know, perhaps it's the sort of question that we avoid because we're not that comfortable with that question. Perhaps we're really shy and our faith is a private faith and that's okay. Or it could be that we feel inadequate to answer the question. Perhaps we feel that if we were to be so bold as make a statement as to who we think Jesus is, that it may offend someone else because our answer might be different to theirs. And anyway, isn't answering the hard theological questions something that you just throw to the minister? I mean, that's what they're there for, right? Who do you say Jesus is? Well, one author tells of Rainer Maria Rilke in one of his letters to a young poet. He encouraged his protege to sit with what he doesn't know and to trust that the questions themselves have great value. Be patient, he wrote, toward all that is unresolved in your heart. Try to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books that are written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them out. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the actual answer. Live the question. Journey with the question. Get to know the question deeply. In our gospel reading this morning, let's pick up this scene. Let's imagine it in our mind's eye. There was Jesus with his disciples traveling north. They had traveled north to Caesarea Philippi. This was a city about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. 
It was a Gentile city and it was originally named Panaeus after the Greek god Pan. But it was in 14 AD that Herod Philip, who was the son of Herod the Great, renamed the city Caesarea after Tiberius Caesar and Philippi, guess where that comes from, himself. So he named it after himself. And within this gospel timeline, this Bible reading is placed approximately six months or so prior to Jesus' crucifixion. So here we are in this space, in time, in Caesarea Philippi, the disciples had been travelling with Jesus for several years. They had heard his public and private teachings. They had watched him in every sort of situation, from healing to trying to find a quiet place to pray. The disciples spent time with their families and they also had their ear to the ground and knew what people were thinking and saying. So as they were making their way through these villages, Jesus asks the question, the zinger, who am I? Where do I stand in this life that we're traveling together? What is it that I mean to you? Now I am reading into that question. Who do you say that I am, says Jesus? And perhaps you're thinking, well, this is a simple question. Why, Carmel, are you complicating this? It's not that difficult, surely. It's just straightforward. We could go to our uniting churches, ecumenical creed, which is sufficient to answer the question, and we could launch into, we believe in one God, and we could continue on, right? Because we all know that. And we could then discover that Jesus is our saviour, our Lord, born of a virgin, our redeemer, our king, uh, anything else that you can think of. Just call it out. Anything? No? Sorry? Friend. Friend. Shepherd. Okay. Sorry? Yeah. Lamb. The Lamb of God. Absolutely. And all these things are so true. And these answers are all correct. So we could just stop there and go and off and have a cup of tea now. We could, but we won't. Because if this was a biblical or a creedal exam, we would get full marks right now. Tick that off. We've done that. We know that. We've got it all sorted. Put it in a box and tuck it away somewhere. And yet, and yet, we are to journey with the question. Matthew tells us the story. When Jesus begins his question, not with the zinger question, he starts with, okay, what do you think people are saying about me? Who do people say that I am? What's the word on the street? What do the polls say? Do you recall being in a classroom and thinking, oh, oh, I know the answer to that. I've got, I know the answer. That's probably what they were thinking. And they tell Jesus the answer to his question. Well, Jesus, here's the answer. People say, you are John the Baptist. Some people say, no, 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 you're Elijah. And someone else pipes up and he thinks he's got the right answer. He says, actually, some people think you're Jeremiah. But well, someone else pops up and says, no, no, prophets, don't forget the prophets. That's who the people think you are. 
The crowds tried to explain Jesus from their own history, from their own experience and understanding of who they thought Jesus was. In today's Australian context, it would be imagining them answering Jesus' questions this way. You know, the evangelicals, it's them. They think you are one of them. And the Catholics and the Pentecostals and the Baptists, you're one of them. Churches of Christ, Presbyterians, Methodists, and then there's the Uniting Church. Well, they have an opinion too. You're one of them. So that would be the equivalent today, 21st century, of what Jesus and, and what was happening with the disciples. Are you getting the picture now? This is really relevant, isn't it? Who knew? Well, Jesus did. That's who. <clears throat> and I find this fascinating that Jesus neither affirms nor denies any of the disciples' answers. He just listens. He lets his friends <clears throat> offer up everything they think they know based on other people's opinions. And it's a good starting point with Jesus. He was examining what they had inherited and they were parroting back the absolutes that they had been taught. The answers are innocuous, they're harmless and traditional and lovely and true and we hear about it and we sing about it and there's nothing wrong with that. That's great, please don't misunderstand. We ought to continue holding these truths but that's not the question. The question is, where is the personal element? That's the, that's the heart of the question. So Jesus moves them from believing someone else's explanation to touching their hearts and filling their thoughts. He moves them away. He moves them on, not away, but on from what they were hearing around them to start articulating what they were experiencing within. But who do you say I am? Oh dear, that changes things a little now. Looking at each disciple in turn, he waits. Forget about other people's theologies and interpretations. Put aside tradition and creed as good as they are for now and think about us here and now, says Jesus. Think about who I am to you. The tears, the laughter, the healing, the prayers. Have you experienced me? Matthew doesn't give us a great deal of detail about the scene at this stage. Was there awkwardness? Have you ever been in a meeting where someone has asked a question and there is a group of people in that room and all of a sudden it goes deathly silent and no one answers? Somebody, someone's thinking, well, I hope somebody else answers. And I'll just sit and wait till somebody else answers. And everyone's thinking the same thing, so no one answers. I wonder if that's what was happening with the disciples. So Jesus waits patiently. And I wonder if Peter felt sorry for Jesus. And his tongue hurtles out something. Or maybe Peter got to the heart of the question. The, the other disciples are probably thinking, go Peter, go Peter, go Peter. Probably when he could take the silence no longer, he allows his tongue to speak. 
and he confesses this phenomenal statement. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Everyone else gasps. Surely Peter's got it right. Surely he gets full marks for getting the answer right. And Jesus goes further. Firstly, in his reaction, he commends and blesses Peter. And then he says he will build his church upon the rock of Peter's declaration, of Peter's confession. And Jesus also promises Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And this is all true and it's worth celebrating. Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah signalled the beginning of Peter's exploration into Jesus' identity and living the question. Note this was the beginning. He didn't just arrive. Even with this statement, it wasn't just, that's it. That's all, folks. Nothing else to see here. That's not what Jesus does. Jesus is prophet, priest, and king, Messiah, the anointed one. Peter did not learn that truth about Jesus, the son of God, the son of the living God, from any other human. He didn't learn it from his parents. He didn't learn it from the teachers in the synagogue or the other disciples. He didn't learn it from others in the crowds. He didn't even learn it through his own study and daily meditations. Jesus says, my father in heaven revealed this to you. God the father opened Peter's understanding and gave him this knowledge. I would like to stop there, but, you know, next, following on in this reading, Jesus actually rebukes Peter. Even after such a high, Peter goes on to tell Jesus what a Messiah should and shouldn't say and should and shouldn't experience. And Jesus spoke about suffering and humiliation. And he turns to Peter with words that still shock us today. Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but human things. You see, as soon as Peter thought he had worked out who Jesus was, the answer to the question, and figured out Jesus' identity, Jesus challenges. Jesus walks with him, affirms him, but also, life happens. Yes, I am the Messiah, says Jesus, but I have so much more to teach you. You have so much more to learn about what it means for me to be the Messiah, says Jesus. So many more answers for you to grow into, to keep living the question. It may be comfortable to accept the easy, feel-good traditional answers to this question that we're comfortable with. But life's not like that. The reality of who Jesus is, is relevant to us today. This is not just an academic exercise. In today's Balcombe Hills 21st century context, who do we say Jesus is in our society today as people go hungry? and homeless, and live in volatile, abusive relationships, or work for wages that cannot sustain a family. Who do we say Jesus is today? When a loved one dies, or we, or we receive news from the doctor that we didn't want, or when life overwhelms us, who do you, personally, individually, and collectively, who do we, who do you 
say that Jesus is. When I was a child, Jesus was different to me than when I was in my 30s or now. I hope that the future will hold Jesus who meets me where I am at that point. Jesus doesn't change. It's not that Jesus changed. I have. Life has. Society has. And yet Jesus meets us and is sufficient for all. Who has Jesus been to you in the past? Who is he now? Who do you hope he will be for you in the future? These are questions to ponder on for the rest of our lives. Questions that have so many others folded into them. When Peter learns in this encounter that Jesus is the Messiah, he discovers that Jesus is present in the questions just as he is in the answers. So allow Jesus to enter more deeply as you live the question. That is Jesus' invitation to us, offered to all in love. Who do you say that I am? Live out my love for all. May God bless his word to us today. Amen. This is a time in this is this is a time in our worship when we take a moment to reflect bring our thoughts, to gather our thoughts, and to bring our gifts, whether they be monetary, whether they be uh, gifts and talents that the Lord has given us through time and service. So if the ushers would like to come forward, please. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your generosity to us. You are the great provider. We thank you for the gifts that you have bestowed upon each one of us, for those here in this building and for those worshipping at home online. We bring our gifts and give them back to your to your service, we thank you for this provision and ask that you take and bless them, multiply them and meet the needs of the community at large. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think we have the prayers for others and the Lord's Prayer. Psalm 24 says, For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. Today, in the prayers for the people, can we have the next slide, please? At the end of each prayer, I will say, together we say, and I invite you as you want to say that prayer with me, this is our prayer. 
a Pentecost prayer. Great God of heaven and earth, give us your wisdom to navigate the trials that come our way. May we be encouraged by the joy we have in your hope so that we will follow your guidance to serve others with generosity and love. Lord, you know our heart, our strength, our weaknesses. Fill us with your spirit as we live as your people. Together we say, this is our prayer. Prayer in our frailty. Dear gracious God, sometimes as a church or as individuals, we have allowed our abilities to define our worth. With the limitations of age and illness, we may doubt our value to the world. But your word says that it is your mission for the world and you share it with us. Your work does not fail, nor does your word return empty. Your everlasting love is for us and will complete the good work you have begun. We remember the prophecy you gave Isaiah that the mountains may move and the hills disappear, but even then your faithful love for us will remain. Together we say, this is our prayer. A prayer for more workers for God's harvest. We remember our sin and its recent decision that our churches be committed to our growth in discipleship, in loving relationships and an increase in numbers and a godly impact on society. We live in a time of contraction in many churches, but we choose to look to you to bring your kingdom to fullness through our people. We give thanks and pray for Christine Palmer and her community ministry role in Suburban Seeds. We commend our chaplains and, Christ and Christian schools to you, enable their students to grow as disciples. We bring before you those in our church who are going through the period of discernment for ministry. We thank you for them and pray that they will discern where your spirit is guiding them. Together we say, this is our prayer. A prayer for the sick. We pray for those in our church community who are ill and unwell. And we pray for your peace and restoration of their health. Pray for their families and those who carry the weight of care and assistance. We think of our friends and families who have struggles with health issues. We lift them to you. Together we say, this is our prayer. And a prayer at this time for peace in the world. Almighty and great God, look with grace upon those who defend their land. Remember the mothers and fathers, the children, widows and orphans, the disabled and helpless, those seeking shelter and refuge. Think of those who reach out to you and to their fellow human beings, looking for mercy and compassion. Bless those who have shown great generosity and solidarity with the refugees from those conflicts. Guide the leaders and governments of the world that they may find a way to bring peace to those conflicts. Together we say, this is our prayer. And the prayer our Lord taught us, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I must apologise to those who might have been concerned when they heard the alarms go off, something was happening. Well, that's true, it was. Uh, the alarm in the preschool wasn't turned off and somebody went into the preschool. Uh, that's a valid thing that normally happens at this time of the day. Um, so let us 
join in, uh, once again in, in singing. This time, love divine, all loves excelling. And again, if we're able, stand and sing together. <coughs> May the blessing of the Holy Trinity of love be upon you. May God take your hand as you go. Christ be your constant companion and the Spirit guide you on the way today and always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen. <laughs>